This morning, I would like to show you a clip. It's from the movie Up in the Air, with, in which George Clooney plays a man whose job is to travel uh, across the US to fire people. That's what he does. He flies in, they get to the office of some company, fires those who have to be fired, and flies out to his next assignment. And in the following clip, the character explained to his new assistant and potential love interest, it's Hollywood, Hollywood movie after all, one of his ultimate goals in life. So let us watch. Hungry much? Our business expense allows $40 each for dinner. I plan on grabbing as many miles as I can. Okay, you gotta fill me in on the miles thing. What is that about? Are you talking about, like, frequent flyer miles? You really wanna know? I'm dying to know. I don't spend a nickel if I can help it unless it somehow profits my mileage account. So what are you saving up for, Hawaii? South of France? It's not like that. The miles are the goal. That's it? You're saving just to save? Let's just say that I have a number in mind and I haven't hit it yet. That's a little abstract. What's the target? I'd rather not. Is it a secret target? It's 10 million miles. Okay. Isn't 10 million just a number? Pi's just a number. Well, we all need a hobby. No, I, I, I don't mean to belittle your collection. I get it. It sounds cool. I'd be the seventh person to do it. More people have walked on the moon. Did they throw you a parade? You get lifetime executive status. You get to meet the chief pilot, Maynard Finch. Wow. And they put your name on the side of a plane. Men get such hard-ons from putting their name on stuff. You guys don't grow up. It's like you need to pee on everything. Oh, now who's stereotyping? Fear of mortality. It's like, yeah, you're gonna die one day. And why do you suppose that's singular to men? Probably because you can't have babies. The baby argument. If I had that many miles, I would show up at an airport, look at the destination board, pick a place, and go. I have 10 million miles. I got my PhD in astrophysics from Harvard. I was named a volunteer of the year in 2005. I'm in charge of my company sales department. I was the chair of the planning and agenda committee for the 41st General Council of the United Church of Canada. Those kind of statements regularly pop in our conversation because we live in a world in which position, status, diploma, title gives a sense of worth to an individual. And usually when we meet someone new, these are the kind of information we first exchange. We know, we know it does not tell the full story of a person, and yet these are the facts that we find important. These are the facts that we value. And one reason for this might be that our accomplishments give us small perks here and there. They make us feel special and unique. We like the prestige and the credibility that comes with them. They make us feel powerful, different, and let's be honest, a little better than the rest of the people. <laughs> In today's reading from the second book of Kings, we meet Naaman. Naaman was the commander-in-chief of the army of the king of Iran, one of Israel's major enemies in that time. This general, we would say in today's language, this general was a big shot, surely a, response, a respected celebrity because he fought and won many battles for his people. All his accomplishments made him a powerful man. He was highly favored by his king. I would not even be surprised if they were on a first name basis. Naaman was also a very rich man who did not travel light. 
For his trip uh, to the kingdom of Israel, we're told he brought with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 full set of sumptuous garments. It's always difficult to calculate in modern term how much this would be, would represent. Let's just say I did some research that 60,000 shekel would be the equivalent of 150 pounds of gold, and the 10 talent of silver must have weighed 750 pounds of pure silver. So you can use your imagination. Naaman have everything, as we understand, have everything for him. Power, fame, wealth, beautiful wife. The only thing missing in his life was health. The great warrior was a leper. And we always have to be careful when we read words uh, like leopard and leprosy in the Bible because uh, they, they translate a Hebrew concept that include several skin disease, and some of them were incurable. But regardless of Naaman's real affliction, skin disease nevertheless is an embarrassing condition because it's very hard to hide. It's not like diabetes, for example. It's, your face on the it's in your face all the time, and sometimes, quite literally, it's in your face. It's, uh, there's no wonder, there's no wonder when Naaman learned that a prophet in the town of Samaria can heal him, that he decided to look for this Elisha. After all, he could afford the best cure possible, the greatest trip, and what's the point to have all this power, all this wealth, if you cannot pull one string or another once in a while to obtain what you need? Hmm? So, after a few verses, I would say, in the story, Naaman finally arrived at Elijah's house with his horses and chariot and all in all. But surprisingly, the prophet does not come out to meet his distinguished guests. Instead, Elijah sent a simple messenger to tell the renowned military leader to wash himself seven times in the Jordan River. And Naaman is not particularly happy about this apparent lack of respect. After all, he might be a leper, but he's still Naaman the great general, the nightmare of his enemies, the first among his people. This so-called prophet could have made a little effort. I don't know. He, he could have come out of his uh, little shack and, and do something like calling upon the name of his God, uh, waving his hand over his scars or utter some magical mumbo jumbo in a strange language. I don't know anything that would be impressive, maybe dramatic, but surely appropriate for a man of his rank. But no, 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 no. Go soak yourself in the nearby muddy river, <laughs> as if there's no rivers back home, as, the, as he never washed his body before. No, Naaman is not staying there and being humiliated further. As been too much to build his reputation for greatness, too long accumulating his vast wealth to be treated like this. And today's adventure could have easily end right here. Naaman would still be considered a leper. The kingdom of Israel and Aram would have been once again at war due to this diplomatic incident. And God knows, only God knows what would have happened to Elisha in all of this. However, the dramatic fulfillment of this story does occur through the intervention of all the small and unnamed people we hardly notice when we read this text. They're the one 
who moved things along. Because without the young slave girl, Naaman would have never had heard of Elisha. Without Elisha, a messenger, he would not know the cure for his disease. And without his servants, Naaman would never have been cured. They are the one who understand the possibility the moment holds. They're the one who coax their master into forgetting his own importance and to go for what really matters. They're the one who point that Naaman would likely stand on one foot for a day or, or recite a sacred text backward if the prophet asked him. So what's the big deal with a quick wash in a small body of water? What does he have to lose? You see, at the end of the day, the one who lives in their lives in the shadow of power, magnificence, opulence, are the main reason for the materialization of transformation and renewal. Too often we assume that we are not smart or important enough to make a difference in our world. We believe it's the privilege uh, reserved for those who are rich, the powerful, those holding a, a prestigious and important position, like, like a president, like a prime minister. We believe that history is written by famous individuals and families after whom buildings will be named in the future. We believe that people like you and I cannot influence our world. We cannot do anything because we're not in charge. We don't have any power, prestige, or credibility. We don't have um, 10 million points in our account, a PhD from a prestigious university, or an award that would give us name recognition. However, in today's story, we are told otherwise. After all, who make things happen here? Who are the real heroes? And who has real power? Yes, power. Power is often what is not what we often imagine or assume. Power can take many shapes, be found in diverse places, and believe it or not, Power is accessible for most of us. For example, there's real power and the courage of speaking up publicly against the unjust redistribution of resources in our society. There is real power in the perseverance of writing regularly letters denouncing the violation of basic human rights by repressive regimes. There is real power in the determination to raise money to bring families of refugees in Canada. There is real power in the hope of our prayers for a just and peaceful world. In the long run, nobody will probably know what we have done. Nobody will Thank, thank us, and nobody might even remember our names, but it does not matter because we use our powers to change our neighborhood. We use our powers to create a better world. We use our powers because that's what we have been called to do. Like it happens so often in the Bible, the story of Naaman is a clash between the famous and the nameless. Those who have privileges and those who cannot, who can see beyond them. We are reminded that we can indulge ourselves in our resources, our assets, our titles, to the point they become a goal in itself, to the point they distract us from what is really important for us. On some days, 
We need to open our minds and listen to those who have the power and the wisdom to see opportunities all around us. On some days, we need to stop hoarding our points and cash them in and use them to do something meaningful and useful. Amen.